Welcome everybody back to a character lab video of the Coilo Stylus Ciliaris. Today I am teaming up with Gabriella Carlson and I will have her link to the video of her form of care in the description below. I hope that you will be able to hear me above the wind. It's a beautiful sunny day. I'm going to take advantage and film this today instead of waiting for the rain to come and then I'm a little bit more stuck with regards to filming options. So my Coilostylus ciliaris is in LECA only in a self-watering setup. And I only have one microfiber through the pot because they like to grow a little bit on the drier side. And I know that sounds a little bit counterproductive as to why are you saying drier and it is a self-watering where there's always a moist environment. Well, I say that because I can manipulate how wet I keep my orchid by how much am I putting water into the reservoir. And right now, because it is winter, the reservoir turns out is empty, but the microfiber is still wet. There's a lot of moisture in that microfiber. So that is drier. That is not the fact that the leka itself in the deposit here of the inner pot is actually touching the reservoir, just the microfiber, and I keep that moist at all times. And for that reason, with a dry reservoir, I now fill up the reservoir to half with only RO water. And my RO water is around 5.8, maybe 6 pH, because my LECA is soaking in a bucket of a steady 8 pH. And in order to not perpetuate a problem with the roots by that high of a pH, I bring it down, make my water more acidic, 5.8, around that margin, so that when the wicking takes place, I somewhat balance out what the LECA would be at. That goes for my fertilizing as well. When this orchid is in active growth, I do fertilize at 300 parts per million, at around 5.8, sometimes I bring it up to 6.3, but usually my bucket is 5.8, my deposit is 5.8, and I, I depend calculation wise on the wicking to do the balancing out of the pH for me within the pot in order to give the orchid the parameters of pHs in order to be able to absorb all the nutrients in those parameters. So these are the two new growths, the second growths from the season of 2020 that started very, very late in the season. So they are a little bit more skinnier and stunted than what I had that had bloomed before. And that's fine in my books because the more structures an orchid has, the more storage and strength she has. So I wasn't expecting these two growths to bloom at all. But one thing I did want to point out is that this orchid is extremely productive on the happy sap front. And that's why you see all my bulbs are stripped of that sheath. The happy sap in this case, because of my environment, which is extremely dry in the summers, I hardly have any humidity, I hardly have any rain. In nature, this orchid would get rained on, have a high amount of humidity, and the happy sap that she produces would disperse because of the environment where she would grow. In my case, I don't have that. And the happy sap sticks around for much longer than I would be happy with pun intended, <laughs> but I have to go in and wipe down the leaves of the happy sap because it impedes the growth of the pseudobulb. It is extremely sticky. The pseudobulb and the sheaths corresponding in the growth are super hard. And all this is in conjunction with the fact that if there's so much happy sap, there are so many options for pests to get attracted to the new growth of this orchid, so she protects herself with a really, really strong sheath around the base. And again, in nature, that would take care of itself, and in my very dry climate, it doesn't. So I go and I slice into the sheath in order to help 
the growth come out. I do not strip it too soon. It's just like a little incision so that this gluey, sticky happy sap doesn't pinch the leaf throughout its development. And then it can actually grow out and develop normally. It is mid-January, 21 now. And you can see that I am starting on new eyes. She is swelling up with new eyes. At least I hope you can see this. There's one right there. And there's one in the back there. And this other little growth has an eye down in here starting to swell as well. So she's going to be coming into active growth very, very soon. There's another one there. I normally get four growths per season. Two of them bloom and two of them develop throughout the rest of winter. And the sphagnum moss here is just a remnant of what I used to do in the past. I use normally use microfiber, but seeing as this is not old sphagnum moss, I still use it in order to keep the surface nice and humid so that the roots that come out that you can see she's growing right now that they don't dry against the lecker and you can see I am missing the mark here I have one dried root tip and that is the result of my super dry environment and my dry top layer which I try to counteract with the sphagnum moss now I'm not too concerned about this one dried root tip because the next one is going in and the next one along is going in as well. So in some cases there is collateral damage and I'm okay with that. So it would be much, much worse in my dry climate if I did not have sphagnum moss on the surface here. And in this case, I'm just going to move a little piece of moss right onto that root there, so I do not compromise the growth point right here by having to spray the surface of the leka. The moss is super forgiving because I can spray it at one end and it will then absorb and move throughout the entire moss. So based on the factors I've just mentioned and what I do to try to help me out in my environment, she likes it very, very hot. She likes it very, very humid. I can provide heat. I cannot provide humidity. And this is how I go about avoiding the fact that things dry out too much and that she struggles too much and making sure she grows clean and doesn't get pinched and stunted in the leaf growth. I have her in extremely high light. In the winter, like at the moment, She's under blurple lights, and that is about 10 hours a day. And if it's a sunny day, the angle of the sun comes in and shines on her directly while she is indoors coping and just tidying herself over the winter. In summer, I have her in very, very bright light, dappled sun, extremely hot. And when I say extremely hot, I can say my temperatures can go to 30 degrees Celsius but there are days and weeks it's up to 40. Again, I have low humidity, 28%, not conducive to the happiness of this orchid. And the bugs are really attracted to the happy sap in my climate. And I'm constantly making sure I clean her off of that happy sap. In the winter, it's more paramount to be on top of it in my environment because there are still bugs around. I have a very mild winter and the bugs don't die off as readily. So she becomes an easy target for a buffet. And in the summer, it's a little bit easier for me to maintain the excessive happy sap she produces because I take plain RO water and spray her down all around, even if there are new growths developing because it is so hot, she will dry off quickly. But I do spray her down in order to keep that happy sap under control. Now. I have a very reflective screen on my camera, so I don't know if I can zoom in and show you. Yeah, I can see it, and I hope you can too. You see that? That is crystallized or dried off happy sap. Incredible. Now I can take a cotton swab 
with some water and wipe it off. But at this point, it doesn't bother her anymore. She has not got any resistance of the growth. They are now mature. So I'm just going to leave it and not mess around. Anything with water this time of year is always a little bit risky. Her blooms are super fragrant. Beautiful, beautiful, lemony. I would say like a lemon sherbet, but you know, there's a little bit more of a hint of a cream behind it. But very, very fragrant very pleasant to the nose and they last about three three and a half weeks it'll take from january to about june another five months before she blooms for for me again and i hope by that time we can do an update on this orchid gabriella carlson and i that would be super interesting you can see more this is happy sap in sheets look at that That's incredible. But she's very productive on the happy sap front. It's something that I need to be very careful of in my hot and dry climate. And of course, in the winter, so as not to make her a bug magnet. I hope that I've covered everything. If you have any further questions regarding this orchid that I haven't covered and I haven't been so diligent about, please feel free to ask away in the comments below. And then Gabriella Carlson has her way of growing this orchid in her climate environment and setup. So the link to that video will be in the description below. Once again, thank you so much, Gabriella, for showing interest, for participating. Should you happen to have this orchid and you see these videos and you say, oh, well, I'm going to do a care video or can I be in on the updates that are coming up? Please contact either myself or Gabriella and we'll be very, very happy to put, get you in with regards to the Care Collab series on this specific orchid, Coelostylus ciliaris. I appreciate you coming to watch this video. Thank you ever, ever so much. Wishing you a wonderful day and stay safe. Take care. Bye.